everyone. Welcome back. We were talking about wheat and the gut, and we're going to continue on that theme, but we're going to get a little more specific. I'm going to tell you something that may spin your head and not make any sense, but the healthy food you're eating might be slowly killing you. And that may, again, be counterintuitive, uh, but how many of you feel not the best? It's like, I'm trying, I'm doing everything right, but it's, I still feel off. And that's where some of what we think may be beneficial is not. And if you look behind Sally, who's joining us today, you see these two words, toxic superfoods. That's also her book, by the way, which I think everybody should run out there and get as soon as you can. But this is literally what we're talking about. There's foods that we think are good for us. There's foods that we believe we're told through podcasts and YouTube or wherever you go, like, go eat this. And that may be the thing that's making you feel horrible. So Sally, thank you for coming here today. This is so important. Oh, it's exciting to be with you today. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Cool. So the book came out. I know that a lot of people have been going through it. I actually reached out to you because of an interview that I watched. And it was funny because it was the day that some of our own clients were asking me, what do you know about oxalates? And I said, not much. They said, who do you know that knows something? I said, no one. And then you popped up. I was like, this is exactly what we needed at the exact right time. Did I manifest this or was it just meant to be? And so what? how is this even possible? That the foods that we think are healing us, like where do we even go? The brain starts spinning. Why is it that you're writing a book telling us that these are the things that we need to avoid? Yeah, because it's um, not something anyone's really thinking about. In textbooks, oxalates, which are a chemical that's ubiquitous in nature and is... Uh, becoming more ubiquitous in our diets in modern times, it's treated like a complete footnote. It's not part of the conversations about our biology, our food, our well-being. It's just absent. And those of us who are trained in nutrition science and the biological sciences and the healing arts think we know enough to dismiss the concept of oxalates. And so none of us bother to take a deep dive. And unfortunately, what's happening is our ignoring of oxalates that we're being exposed through through our food is causing a lot of problems. And, and the more you try to get healthy, the worse your health gets, the more frustrated you get. And you have to pile it on thicker and thicker. And people who do that can have such a crash in their health that they become disabled. And I was one of them. When I figured out that this huge array of problems that had been dogging me for decades and had gotten to the point where now I could no longer work or read or function was in the healthy foods that I made so much effort to grow and cook and eat was just killing me because, hey, I'm in the field of nutrition and public health. I was supposed to know stuff like this. This mm. is the whole point of being in the field was for health promotion and what we're promoting as healthy is can be quite the opposite. So I just was not going to let that be, oh, thanks for the information and move on. No, I needed to find out more and throw up a little SOS for other people who are making that same mistake. So that's the birth of toxic superfoods. So for, for someone that doesn't know, what exactly is an oxalate and what does it do to your body? Oxalates start off as this little chemical called oxalic acid. It's a two carbon molecule with four oxygens on it. It's easily made in nature. Even pollution makes it. The funguses in the soil make it. Plants make it. And it's very useful for plants. Um, and we, we're getting it not just in this acid form called oxalic acid, but we get it in the oxalate form, which is technically called a salt, where the, the oxalic acid, because of its charges, chelates or connects with minerals and forms these salts that tend to crystallize and they form crystals. Mm -hmm. Plants take advantage of that to build crystals specifically with calcium oxalate, which is the dominant form in nature. So in the foods that we're eating that have plant-made oxalates, we're getting both the oxalic acid, which is called soluble oxalate, and the calcium oxalate crystals that the plants build, which is called insoluble oxalates. And, and the crystals are hard like quartz. And it's like sandpaper. It's Some of them are shaped like little toothpicks. The plants make all these different shapes for different reasons. So we're eating hard quartz-like sandpaper and we're eating acid that flows just passively, diffuses between the cells of the stomach cells and the gut lining cells right into hepatic circulation, takes it straight to the liver. And this is a chemical that has toxic effects on cells. And like all toxins, it's a dose problem. But when there's enough around, 
it causes massive problems to cells. And the liver has no way to metabolize it, has no enzymes to break it down in humans at all. What the liver does is it actually makes more oxalate. Mm. And so the liver produces oxalic acid, especially high if you're low in B1 or B6, if there's a lot of inflammation going on, any kind of deficiencies and in, in metabolic stress, you see more production of ox oxalic acid in the body. So you get oxalic acid coming in from the plants and then you're stressed out liver who gets really stressed when there's a lot of oxalic acid coming in from the plants and your gut gets really stressed when there's a lot of crystally sandpaper irritating it as well. You would have additional oxalate coming out of the liver in addition to what you've absorbed from your food. So <laughs> you've got, you're exposing your gut to oxalate and oxalate crystals, your liver, and then your circulatory system, which the next stop of um, this oxalic acid is your heart. Two inches above the liver is the heart. Then the blood is sent to the lungs for oxygen. It's sent back to the heart. So before you have any metabolic chance to do excrete this stuff, you've you've got you've hit the major organs of the body: your vascular system, your liver, your heart, and your lungs. And so the uh, damaging effects are many. It's even hard to explain them all because it just sounds it goes on and on. But one of the big problems is this chelation problem. Means it's disturbing the balance of electrolytes and minerals like calcium. That's really critical in a cell. Mm -hmm. It also has, when it, especially when it's forming crystals, which it tends to do when it encounters tissues that have certain metabolic qualities. So when you're, when you're a reproducing cell, you have slightly different amounts of hyaluronic acid and so on, and, and you're much more sticky. When you've got inflammation, infection, injury, if you've got little bits of um, cell debris around because cells are dying or were cut or bruised or worn out today, those are areas where the oxalic acid starts what we call precipitating out into crystals and starts sticking and accumulating in tissue. So we tend to get accumulation problems of oxalate crystals forming in tissues some of it's just random what you what cells were turning over today or what cells are reproducing or where you've got infection injury or problems so if you've had an old injury this is an area where you're likely to have oxalates collect and unfortunately um, science thinks that oxalate accumulation in tissues is a product of kidney failure because it's the kidney's job to release oxalate from the body and take it out if they are in theory the kidneys take out a, at least 90% of the oxalates that get into our system. But that's not really true. <laughs> There's a lot, that's the other problem with oxalate information out there is that the mainstream story has got it wrong in so many ways. How could it be that it requires renal failure to accumulate oxalate if 70 to 90% of us have oxalate crystals in our thyroid gland? 70% wow. of us do not have renal failure. Yeah. We don't. Yeah. So there's, you know, really basic, obvious things where a lot of the information out there isn't right, but the effects that oxalate are having is not just disruption of electrolytes and minerals. It's, it causes a membrane damage and that causes cells to break down and their ability to control their function. Uh, and it, it just, it's amazing the oxidative stress that this puts on the cells and how this ends up turning on inflammation, both in the acute exposure after meals, so to speak, where you've got the oxalic acid running around and starting to stick and crystallize. There's acute exposure problems that immediately changes how the, the circulating monocytes in the bloodstream function, and they start putting out pro-inflammatory cytokines and reducing their anti-inflammatory cytokines because they are damaged by this oxidative stress that's going on. So you basically turn your heroes that are supposed to save you yeah. from infection and help protect your barrier function, your barrier function is getting damaged by crystals and oxalate, then the immune cells that are supposed to deal with that are sick. And uh, you know, just at the gut level, there's lots of more research needed that demonstrates how this also changes the energy metabolism in all cells, not just your immune cells, but those cells lining the gut, for example, that once you have a breach in the gut, there's an immediate filling in process that has to happen where the cells start pushing in and filling in the breach to heal it over. But when the cells are energetically damaged by oxalates, which in many ways is the oxidative stress, it's the effect on the mitochondrial function. It's the sitting on the enzymes that run complex two and glycolysis and 
all these things, and even glucose production, where the cell replication rate slows down and the ability to heal acute wounds or long-term injuries becomes retarded. And you end up over time, if this is a constant situation where cells remain in this stress toxic state, you end up with a tendency toward fibrosis. And with the crystals collecting in tissues, you end up for tendencies towards cyst problems and um, other kinds of weird autoimmune problems that we think of as autoimmune disease, but it's really a particulate pollution problem building mm -hmm. up in the system. Yeah, when I listen to you, first of all, it's, it sounds like everyone that's walking around with the autoimmune condition, the, quite, the big question marks, you know, nobody can tell me what's wrong, nobody can fix me. This may be their answer, right? It's head to toe. It's, a, it's not only inflammation, it's also fibrosis. It's like, it, it's like you just summarized every problem I've ever heard about from any other inflammatory insult or toxic pollutant into one kryptonite. And it's that one kryptonite that a lot of people aren't looking at. And all of a sudden there's this thing and you're solving the wrong problem and that's why your problem isn't going away. Yeah, we're not defining the real problem if we still have a problem. Like yeah. we, we keep trying to put band-aids on things and we're doing this in research where we look, we're looking for the uh, how this turns on, say, what is it called? MCP1, mm -hmm. for example, things like this in, the, in, in your metabolism. Okay, this is turning, this is the chemo attractant protein. It says, come on over here, immune system, and deal with this mess we got. Well, you're going to interrupt that process. That's, you know, we find these different spots where the body's trying to deal with the, the toxicity and the deficiency and the effect on cell function that's causing the cells to put out alarm distress signals like the leaking of potassium from cells and the leaking of ATP from cells. <laughs> the cells are struggling and the immune, it turns on the processes of self defense. And in our research, we're looking for how to turn off self defense rather than how to find the culprit in the first place. Hmm. So based on your research, what's this uh, dirty dozen, if we call it that? Like, what are the foods that stand out to you? Like, here's what's getting to everybody. I, I would say, you know, as a culture, we got real interested in potatoes a few hundred years ago. And then in the 1950s, we learned how to make them commercially into french fries and potato chips mm -hmm. and then in the schools the tater tots so we're being raised on potatoes to an excessive degree for the last couple of hundred years but the last 70 years they've become and in fact the last 10 years you can hardly get through a day without being offered hash browns french fries or potato chips in almost every meal mm -hmm. and then there's peanut butter that was invented as a human food about a hundred years ago and peanut butter is ubiquitous in candies and, and childhood foods. So just raising up, on it, regardless of your health philosophies, most people are raised on peanuts, potatoes, and chocolate. So it doesn't matter what your health style is. Usually that's ubiquitous. And children are first fed things like sweet potatoes. And now new baby foods are full of things like spinach and quinoa. So these Pseudo grains, which have become fashionable now, buckwheat, quinoa, teff, they're being used more heavily now because people are struggling with the gluten thing. And so they're going on gluten free mm -hmm. diets and they're replacing gluten with those pseudo grains and with nut flours, particularly almond flour. Almonds, in my opinion, are the most toxic food out there. Wow. And they're ubiquitous. So you when can't you can't go into a gas station without seeing almond milk. Yeah, they're everywhere. When you say that, is there something to be said about their current form or is it just in general from way back when an almond was almond is still an almond or has, have they changed? It's, it's the almond itself. That's the almond the itself. Okay. Is the, and it's, and if you want organic almonds, they have more molds on them because you can't use the fungicides mm. and they're laying on the ground under tarps and, you know, and molds produce oxalate too. So, um, uh, the black mold aspergillus, is a great oxalate producer. And so some grains too, are, the, the amount of oxalate in grains varies. Now the bran is the place where oxalate tends to be concentrated because in seeds, which the grain is a type of seed, the, the plants tend to put the oxalate in the outer surfaces. So the bran area is where you see the highest concentration of oxalate. Um, and, and, and so stripping them down to white rice, for example, lowers the oxalate a lot. But if a, let's say, white bread flour was not handled properly and had moisture in it or was already moldy when it came out of the field, the level of oxalate will be higher in mm -hmm. um, grains that are prone to mold and other foods that are prone to mold. So there's, 
there's not a good way to even nail down how much oxalates are in foods because of contamination issues and because of natural variability. So bran generally, yes, and grains generally, yes. Uh, and But almonds, you know, the seeds are inherently indigestible. They have many other compounds in them that make them hard to digest. And many of them carry noxic, noxious heavy metals. And, and almonds are a great example of that. Uh, and there's a lot of what we call bioavailability to the oxalate in almonds and peanuts and cashews. Uh, and that is the solubility factor in them is pretty high, meaning a, a lot of it can be absorbed. And they're low in calcium, which is a binder that might reduce absorption, but not to the extent that people want to believe that it does. Hmm. But almonds, it turns out, and you can see this in the earliest research of oxalate, the very first really extensive experimental style study of oxalate poisoning was published in 1823. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> These guys were amazing. Amazing. Very, early, very good study. It's like 55 pages long. It's a long read. You have to take several weekends to re really get through <laughs> it. And they just, because in the day, they didn't have page restrictions. They ex described what they did in great detail to what I believe was probably a number of stray animals, dogs and cats and rabbits and all kinds of stuff that were, were in, in, um, put down the throat, some dilution of oxalate and then they were shut off so they couldn't puke it up because the body's normal reaction to a toxic load of oxalate would be vomiting. Mm. Um, and so they, what they found was the more dilute that solution of oxalate, the more toxic it was to the animals and deadly. Mm -hmm. They looked at how the animals died. What they were looking for was evidence that oxalate killed the animal after they died because people were dying of oxalate poisoning a lot in the early 1800s because oxalic acid is a cleaning compound that lifts rust and bleaches things. So you can take the rust out of your patio and the rust off your engine and do all kinds of polish your brass, whiten your leather, it, prepare cotton. You can do a lot with oxalic acid. So it was in the household mm. in poorly labeled containers, often handled by illiterate people. And people would accidentally take it thinking it was Epsom salts for a stomach ache and they'd be dead very quickly. And they realized that this was the perfect murder weapon. You could slip this tart stuff into um, somebody's orange juice or lemonade and start poisoning them pretty easily. And they would want to know if, a, if someone died, died of oxalate poisoning or not. So this is the main point of the study was to understand if you did an autopsy on a dead person, could you see the oxalate poisoning mm -hmm. and then convict somebody of murder. That was part of the point. But the real interesting outcome to me of that study was the fact that the more dilute the solution, the more toxic it was. And what is a beautiful dilute solution of oxalic acid? Almond milk, hmm. spinach smoothies. When you have a lot of water, when it's a watery food, that allows the soluble ion to float freely and increases its ability to get into your bloodstream. Mm. So it's almost the opposite of what you would assume. I'm diluting this thing down, but you're actually uh, empowering it to kill you. You got it. And Incredible. we're doing this to children. There was this uh, report recently. I don't know how, I haven't verified all the facts on it, but it makes a point, And that is a parent brought a child dying because this infant was being given almond milk instead of infant formula or breast milk. People assume something called a milk is, can be used like milk. Mm -hmm. It can't be. It's, very, it's not really a food. Uh, almond milk is a faux substitute for the concept that you need something to pour in your coffee. It's not really a food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we see that over and over again from people that they're not feeling well. I personally had never, you know, put the blame on the oxalate itself. But we see over and over again people that are switching to almond and oat milk. And oat milk being full of, you know, seed and vegetable oils and linoleic acid and all of that nonsense. And not understanding why they don't feel well. And they're like, even my coffee doesn't pick me up anymore. And then that's where we started, well, what's in your coffee? And we realized the day they switched to oat and almond milk was the day they started going downhill. You know, that it's the overload. Yeah, like you said, it may be a substitute once in a while, but if it becomes a daily regimen, it's part of your nutrition, you know, uh, plan, uh, it's probably an overload. And um, so is oat milk in the same boat? It's not nearly as high in oxalate, but it's definitely not 
not really a nutritious food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's well, interesting that you were able to put the two, two together that on the onset of this new diet behavior, you saw a shift in the symptoms. A lot of us cannot make the connection. And that's really the biggest problem with this is it's very hard based on symptoms to connect it. And there's good reasons for that. The delayed effects, you know, for example, it takes about four hours or more to have a peak absorption. So you don't absorb it instantaneously, although those effects that were shown in the pro-inflammatory damage done to the monocytes in your bloodstream were measured at 40 minutes past the drinking of a spinach smoothie. Yeah. So only 40 minutes, even though that's just the beginning, that's maybe 20% at best of how much you're ultimately going to absorb. Because it's a 24-hour transit time, and some people say it takes four to six days for really all the oxalate to really move through, probably because it gets hung up in place. I don't know why. I think the science is really hard to do, and the science is highly imperfect. So it's hard to quote ideas like that that, eh, I don't know. But that really, you don't see symptoms. And if you're going to get an acute symptom directly from that load of oxalate, you're, say you're almond butter slathered almond keto toast yeah. <laughs> snack at bedtime is four hours later that you're going to wake up at two in the morning feeling sickly or having mm. to pee or having hiccups or having belching or something like this because the electrolyte disturbance is going to be at its worst at that four hour peak. And that's where you're going to see these tremors and twitches from a hyperactive nervous system where you can't sleep anymore or the bladder starts filling up with oxalates and you start getting a need to get up and pee or and then suddenly you're peeing big volumes of mm. urine uh, these are all examples of acute effects of that initial um, spinach smoothie or whatever and then so it was four hours ago it, like you didn't think and who right. would blame a spinach smoothie exactly. or yeah. a sweet potato yeah. with dinner you just yeah. never think that because first of all no one wears lenses of oxalate when they look at food they don't say hmm that's a lot of oxalate it's yeah. like, Nobody knows how to think about it because they don't even know what foods have it. And I, I know right now everyone's standing at their pantry like, are you kidding me? Like, what, what do I, I just finished changing my whole life, moving everything upside down to get quote unquote healthy. And now you're telling me I did everything wrong. So and, and I, I know there's a bit of discouragement there. There's a bit of like, well, I give up. I'm going back to my potato chips. You know, but what does somebody like, what does your diet look like? What, what have you brought it down to that made you feel so much better? Because you were in bad shape and now you're not. So what does your pantry yeah, look like? It was. Well, I don't have a huge pantry. And right now there's a wall of different canned fishes. Okay. <laughs> like sardines and stuff like that. And coconut milk, coconut's very low in oxalate. We like crystallized ginger, which is even this not organic sugar even, and we're cool with that too. I mean, I generally, I don't like inorganic sugar, but mm. we let ourselves have the crystallized ginger because it's, um, A, it's a delicious quick treat, and B, it's boiled for an hour. So even though ginger, fresh ginger is like 89% soluble oxalate, and it's mm -hmm. fairly high in oxalate, the um, boiled crystallized ginger is very low in oxalate. And so there's ways to get around some of these foods. But what, what you're talking about is that pantry. Someone just sent me a picture yesterday. She just, she got my book then she went to her pantry and she pulled out like 20 things in her pantry yeah. that all had almond flour, chocolate, turmeric, plantain chips, sweet potato chips, sweet potato this, sweet potato that. She had all this stuff with almonds. Like it's in these packaged convenience foods in these mixes for like quick homemade, healthy, mm -hmm. gluten-free muffins and stuff. These ingredients are ubiquitous. Even arrowroot is high in oxalate. And then there's the chi chi chia seeds and things are seeded like crazy, like coated in seeds, breads are yeah. full of seeds, crackers are full of seeds. Uh, and, you know, then there's that turmeric. And occasionally people are getting into too much things like pomegranate and kiwi. Um, so, and then the black beans are really popular still, black beans white beans, pinto beans, kind of high. Hmm. So, you know, to switch that over, it's not really that hard, except that those are the cool, cool, cool foods that you can get when you go out to Chipotle and, yeah, yeah. you know, pop into the gas station and grab some nutted whatever, you know, it's, it's convenient now. Those things are selling, they're in the marketplace. So the main problem with your pantry is that it needs to be in your freezer. It needs to be frozen meat and fresh, good, cheeses and decent eggs and 
you know, this is not a lot of convenience foods that are really going to support you in great health. And this is why Honestly. we feel like a lot of people switch to something like a carnivore diet, you know, and they yeah. feel this relief. And it's not because you're meant to eat like a carnivore. You've It's more about what you've eliminated in order to have that diet often. Uh, yeah, some people thrive on saturated fats. Many don't. The genetics of that is clear. We can look at, for example, the APOA2 pathway and determine do you actually thrive as a vegan or, or sorry, I should say on a keto diet, high fat diet or not. But having said all that, when you remove this constant trickle of inflammatory and fibrotic insults and you're just leaning on meat, uh, yeah, you might feel amazing. And it's not so much about here's what I eat. It's about here's all of what I got rid of. Right. Yep. And, and you're focused on this one thing that has no threat. Um, and that may be a simple test for everybody, you know, and, and I do understand that uh, you've probably seen this also, that the outcome is variable. Like some people, it's is a nine out of 10 or is a two out of 10. And we understand our genetics are different. The way we cope with oxidative stress, very easily determinable and different. The way we deal with inflammation, very determinable and different. So just because you don't feel this is almost the most dangerous part. Just because you don't feel it doesn't mean it's not happening. It's just below your awareness. So it's a chronic trickle versus the acute. That person's actually somewhat blessed that they feel it and they know so that they make a change totally. versus the person that doesn't know it's outside of their awareness, but it's still happening. It's just a two out of 10, two out of 10 for 20 years is going to be a big problem, right? So it's regardless, you, you want to eliminate some of these things and maybe replace them with things that are clean perfectly said if that could really sink into people because even even during this phase when you're asymptomatically slowly trickling in a poison all the time yeah. all the time that's the other problem is you never really have that carnivore break that might have been more traditional in times when foods were seasonal um, now you get these same foods all the mm. time and you don't get a winter break i think winter time we're really designed as this kind of a detox sort of carnivore season right um that really works well if you have an annual clean out of your oxalates every January and February, you're just detoxing your, you know, detoxing. It's not a detox. It's an excretion process that's very inflammatory. It takes the immune system to go dig out this mess and remove it from the body. But it's it's this break. And you see it in the literature where people can get away with like slamming these antioxidant foods and doing all these great things for themselves, almonds everywhere. And they feel great for two years, five years, six years, 10 years, and then they collapse in renal failure and complete, almost like PTSD. Mm. They're so damaged. And it just suddenly exposes underneath where that energy crisis that was being set up in your system and the loss of metabolic reserves, suddenly you, you re reached a breaking point and you're really broken. And if you're in your 80s when this happens, the chances of you regaining your vitality are practically nil at that stage. The digestive process isn't just about breaking down food, it's about absorbing nutrients and eliminating waste. This is crucial for maintaining a healthy balance in your body and preventing chronic diseases. Our friends at Bioptimizers have a really powerful enzyme supplement that helps you digest your food better so you can get more out of it. It's called Mazymes. Mazymes takes your unique DNA into account by using the best enzymes active at a variety of pH levels to support your digestion throughout your entire digestive tract. Plus, it has Astrozyme, a blend of highly active systemic enzymes to help improve nutrient absorption and support a healthy gut microbiome. Experience optimal digestion the way your body is meant to. So go to bioptimizers.com, that's B-I-O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E-R-S dot com, and use the code DNAGO to get 10% off your order. So when it comes to, you went through this yourself, this is why I'm asking, um, making these changes which are difficult because it's not only you, it's your family, if you have kids, it's your spouse who maybe thinks you're gone bonkers and reading into something that isn't necessary. How do you actually make the changes? Like what's the, the practical steps of like, here's how I get people's buy-in, here's how I get support, here's how this becomes permanent. Like what did you go through? 
Well, you know, my initial thing was like, well, I can't remember the list. Like, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to eat or not eat. Like, right. Yeah. A lot of like, ooh, ooh. like, so I mean, the first thing to do is just really start to get to know what foods are high and low in oxalate. And you can't do that by surfing the internet because none of the lists agree. There's lots of mistakes. Even the muddy Harvard list is full of lots of mistakes. Actually, I'm coming out with a data list that hopefully will be way above average. I say that with lack of confidence because it's very easy to be fooled by data, to introduce new mistakes in data, to miss someone else's mistake in data. You know, and what we tend to do is this game of telephone with everything, especially with data, where you you think you got a piece of information, you try to pass it on, in the passing on, it's not received properly or it's not sent properly, or one way or another, mistakes get added. And with data, man, it's scary how easy it is to introduce mistakes. So that said. You can't trust the data, but I've got, it, that's why it's really important to just generally use the high and low list like I have in the beginner's guide on my website. There's multiple versions of them in the book. That alone is a reason to have the book is to kind of get straight and then get a sense. I have this inventory where you can look at what foods you've been eating. And if you've been uh -huh. eating a lot of these foods, think, think about either now or past. It, it doesn't matter if you had a homemade almond milk habit back 20 years ago before almond milk was on the market and you guys were eating almond milk that was six times worse than the commercial ones are now in terms of concentration and still watery solutions, still dilute enough to be really toxic, your body now may be in trouble because of that 20-year-old habit. So when you're looking at your exposure, what food you've had, you really have to think about your whole life. Did you grow up as a peanut butter fiend? Were you rebelling against your parents in 12th grade and refusing to eat anything but Pringles for a year, you know, like wh where did you make oxalate mistakes in the past? Did you like me garden Swiss chard every year, every summer, and then try to eat giant dinners of it because you have too much in the garden. So you're making yourself <laughs> eat piles of it. You know, think about all those kinds of ways where you've exposed yourself on and off to these high oxalate foods. And then, um, which of those can you live without? I mean, really, if you didn't ever eat Swiss chard again, would you be heartbroken, honestly? The kids would probably be <laughs> Start happy. Start with that one. <laughs> it's the kids. Most babies and children really are not interested in your high oxalate vegetables, especially the greens. I don't know if I emphasize, there's really just three greens. This is another big mistake and myth, is that, oh, if you eat low oxalate, you never eat greens again. Not true. It's just spinach, chard, and beet greens. And chard and beet greens is basically the same plant. It's chard is a beet without a beet. It's this, so it's really just chard, beet greens, one plant. You see them in the little baby lettuces mm -hmm. and all that. And the spinach, and then sorrel, which is fancy food in a restaurant. Some gardeners will grow sorrel, um, but those are the bad ones. The other greens are fine from an oxalate standpoint. Um, so, but you know, there are some uh, some of the foods you're not willing to give up in the beginning. Your potatoes, your sweet potato, your dark chocolate. You can wait on them, but you want to start thinking portions at least. If you're like I was eating like a whole sweet potato, maybe uh -huh. you could eat a third of a sweet potato and and have a little bigger portion of meat and add a scoop of cottage cheese or something. Like like fill up your plate with something other than high oxalate foods and slowly start learning how to cook with other things and be thinking about variety. I think people generally are under eating protein as a rule. Mm -hmm. And you could think about how to put multiple proteins in a meal so that you get enough protein that, and enough fats of the right kind of fats. Then it's easier to like, yeah, I can live without a sweet potato today. So it's a, it's a process and it's better to do it as a process because if you do the sudden drop from high oxalate vegetarianism to carnivore, which is happening to people, that's such an a, a abrupt shift. The body is clearly hearing that one. That is a loud slam in terms of a metabolic change in the body. And the body responds sometimes pretty vigorously with the desire to remove oxalate from the tissues. And it's different in each person. And there isn't science about how this works very well. Other than it, they say that it takes about three days metabolically to outfit a cell with this kind of reverse process. The cells have been in the kind of sequestration, hold on to it mode to try to protect the vascular system and the heart and the kidneys from the, the acute spikes in oxalate. And so they've been in this hold it, store it, grab it mode, and but they can change their outfits, you know, they can hit different genes and turn on different proteins 
and start excreting oxalate from tissues and cells and start turning on the, inviting the immune cells to come by and try to phagocytize, which often doesn't work. So they, they try the giant cell approach and then they try bombing tissues with collagenase and acids to break up oxalate crystals. You want that to happen in a nice, slow kind of way mm -hmm. because you can get so much oxalate moving around, it's more toxic than it was coming in. And for two reasons, one is digging it up is so acidifying, all that immune activity creates more acidity and, and metabolic stress. You've got more of the pro-inflammatory chemicals in your system and you're putting out this toxin all at the same time and it can be very high doses. So all that to say is if you go slow and kind of drag your anchor a little bit and kind of like, yeah, I don't wanna stop my chocolate. You don't have to, you can just start with like, well, give up the quinoa. Yeah. And, and pay attention to how you feel because it, it, there's some people that may, it's it's it, it's hard to hear give up the quinoa for some people because they've read and heard so <laughs> much that this makes no sense that's one thing i'm not going to listen to this woman doesn't know what she's saying you know so i can tell you that i you know so migraines was one of the things that drove me towards taking care of myself i had crazy migraines mm. debilitating mm. couldn't work couldn't function cleaned up my diet mm. or so i thought right until i listened to you uh and i would say it's in the last seven eight months that i went through this uh i developed a new habit of replacing a meal with a smoothie because there's this last bit of weight where i want to be able to see my abs and feel the reward for my training and my workout and i'm like okay well i'm going to reduce the calories a little bit so i can finally see those lines and so what was my smoothie it was protein powder eggs uh and some banana berry and then spinach and almond butter, right? So this is what I was doing. So blending the spinach, like you said, diluting it and create it to be, allowing it to be even more toxic and then putting a dollop of almond butter in there. So I can tell you that about three, four weeks into this, I started to get headaches again, right? Now, keep in mind, my gut, I have the worst possible protective genetics around gut detox, uh, I'm actually missing the key gene that protects mm. the gut from, you know, uses glutathione to bind toxins except, and get rid of them. Mm. So, um, so things do hit me a little quicker and harder. And I started to look at the protein power bottle because I, I was thinking for that mindset of like, this is the processed stuff here, right? Like, what did they make? So I switched to a different powder and I still felt bad. Um, so I started to look at everything, but what I thought was quote unquote healthy the spinach and the almonds and now i know that that's because i stopped by the way i stopped the smoothie um and i started uh just eating another light meal a uh, heavy protein meal and the headaches went away so i never uncovered what it was but you just helped me figure that out so i i do understand that this is a stumbling block for people like I don't know, like I've heard too much good stuff about spinach to believe this, right? So just listen to your body, listen to, go try it. Go eat almond butter for the next six days straight, every day on every meal and see how you feel, right? Try it, listen to your body, but do pay attention. Do pay attention to your body, track what happened that day, what did you eat, what got you there? Uh, and you'll see, and I only say this because I've heard of so many people uh, being healed when they got off oxalates. I just didn't realize until now how prolific it was. It's really quite something. And unfortunately, all this heavy faith we have in foods like spinach and quinoa are just based on fanciful kind of internet notions. They're not based on the science. When you look at the science, it's clearly a problem. They use the saponins that is another toxin that quinoa is famous for. You know, if you rinse normal quinoa, it gets a little foamy and soapy. That's the saponins and the quinoa. Soap dissolves fat. Your membranes are made of fat. They use saponins in order to make membranes permeable to get more oxalate into cells to study how oxalate and calcium works in cells. They use this combination of saponins and oxalate to like wreck cells and start screwing with the insides of cells. Like quinoa is a perfect way to ruin your gut. Hmm. Ideal. Wow. <laughs> Why you think it's so great is because someone invented the idea that it's higher in protein than wheat. And so therefore it's awesome. We have this benefits only. If we can figure out one little hack that yeah. makes it a benefit, we're going to ignore all the other information out there and, and have this kind of tunnel vision that we're going to grab this biohack and believe in this great thing. 
it's not rational to think that things like that have only upsides and they're and they we're not considering risks hmm. no you're right and we, we look for that macro you know power in whatever that whatever that goal is that's the only metric you're looking at how much protein did i get today uh, and that's why you read your ingredients and oxalate isn't listed as an ingredient you don't see it there's no like you said there's no guide or index telling you where things are at you have to do your work uh, and that's where you know the world has to thank you for what you did uh, you put this book out there because it's a real problem and i've been listening to you and learning and changing things in myself where i thought i was doing things right and starting to feel even better you know there's there's so much you can learn and just keep getting better and better and better you just keep pushing your source of self towards learning how much better you can actually be. So thank you. Um, the book is amazing. I recommend anyone that's listening, pick it up, learn, uh, you know, learn first, for example, you get details about what actually to focus on, what to eliminate and what all the threats are. Uh, you'll learn more about why they are threats. Um, thank you for coming here and joining us. This was awesome. Something we really need to talk about and, and thank you for doing the work to uncover it for everybody. Well, I'm glad it's landing on receptive ears. That's that's my my main goal, and it has really been a mission and, and uh, kind of crazy. No one else does it because it's not paid work, and it takes years of yeah. lots of work. And then to try to figure out how to explain it, pull it together, and explain it is an effort. And effort isn't a thing people generally do anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> we want a quick answer. Yeah. And this isn't that. So, but it's really, the time is now. And I think the fact that you had this like spiritual coming together all in the same day around the yeah. 3rd of January, the day this book was born to the world is, is good news. Maybe, maybe our, our consciousness will align to realize this is a thing and be able to so simply help ourselves for essentially no expense at all. Yeah, simple, like you said, simple is a key word. Simple tweaks that can make a huge impact. Yeah. I'm so glad you're not going to be doing migraines anymore. <laughs> yes, thank you for that. So thanks for coming here again. Thank this you. was awesome. Uh, everybody, the book is Toxic Superfoods. With Sally Norton, take a look. She's been uh, touring around, speaking everywhere, so you can find other interviews if you want to learn more. But dive in, get the book, and help yourself and your family. Thanks. <laughs>